In 1914, Britain and Germany engaged in what was to become the most devastating conflict in human history. Popular accounts take a very linear approach to Anglo-German relations in the preceding years, with war being the natural endpoint of escalating tensions between the two nations. Yet, often overlooked is the major detente that occurred in the relationship between London and Berlin in the final few years before the July crisis, to such an extent that the door increasingly seemed open for some kind of understanding. At the forefront of this thought was an obscure private secretary at the Foreign Office, Sir William Tyrell, who in the summer of 1914 planned to meet with Gotlib von Jago, the German Foreign Minister, in an attempt to cement the increasingly friendly overtures. This video then will look at why Anglo-German relations were improving in the years prior to the First World War, and what may have become of them had the July Crisis never intervened. The reasons for Anglo-German antagonism in the early 20th century are well known, but must still be briefly covered. Chief among the many conflicts was the naval arms race, often dated as beginning in earnest with Britain's launching of HMS Dreadnought in 1906, the most advanced battleship to have ever been produced at that point. Germany had already been creating the foundations for a large navy of its own, but the scenes of panic in Berlin following the launching of Dreadnought sent the race into overdrive. Germany trying to threaten the Royal Navy's dominance of the North Sea, and so force Britain into an alliance on Berlin's terms. Britain, on the other hand, fighting to maintain its freedom of action in international affairs. As the Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey put it, if the German fleet becomes superior to ours, the German army can conquer this country. The race caused an immense amount of bad blood between the two nations. In Britain, several invasion scare books were produced, whilst in Germany, the membership of naval leagues swelled. Britain attempted to call a halt to the horrendously expensive competition several times, but Germany, confident they could win, continued the contest. Yet, for all the aggression on both sides of the North Sea, this tension began to rapidly ease in 1912. With no large conscript army to also maintain, the British government had gone all in on the race, and convincingly won. The Germans recognised as much, and quietly ended the contest by scaling down naval construction. This wasn't because the Wilhelmstrasse was suffering with an outbreak of sanity for once, but rather because a greater enemy was now presenting itself in the East that was to prove a challenge for both London and Berlin. Russian power had been badly neutered by their defeat at the hands of Japan in 1905. For more than half a decade they had been recovering from the war, and it was partly for this reason Britain formed such a strong bond with France, propping it up in a balance of power that favoured the Triple Alliance. But from 1912, Russian power was resurgent. French loans, huge industrial growth, and successively good harvests all swelled the Treasury's coffers. St. Petersburg consequently embarked on a period of massive rearmament from 1912, the Great Programme, as it was known, due to be completed in 1917. This was why Germany reluctantly conceded the naval arms race, and instead diverted maritime funds to the army. The 1913 army bill saw the Reich's peacetime force swell from 136,000 men to 890,000. Yet even this wasn't enough to assuage Berlin's fears. With the expanding Russian army numbering over 1.5 million men in peacetime, 300,000 more than the combined strength of Germany and Austria. The strategic situation still looked perilous, especially as the gap was only set to widen. By 1917, German military planners predicted that Russia would be unbeatable in a war, and Germany permanently on the back foot in the balance of power. Yet Russia's resurgence was also causing worry in London. In 1907, The Great Game, a century-long competition between Britain and Russia for influence in Central Asia, was ended with the Anglo-Russian Convention. For a time, Russian weakness meant St. Petersburg stuck to the agreement over the zones of influence in nations like Persia. But with their power recovering, the Russians were once again up to their old tricks, violating the convention to the extent that by 1914, it increasingly looked like a dead letter, unless something drastic could be done. Circumstances were then conspiring to bring Britain and Germany closer together, and there was solid evidence to show an improvement in relations. London and Berlin were the main mediators in the Balkan Wars between 1912 and 1913, both acting as calming influences that prevented the conflicts from spreading. 
Even more tellingly, in 1914 they had come to an agreement on the Berlin-Baghdad railway Germany was building and Britain had previously been concerned about, allowing them to both cooperate in propping the Ottomans up as a check on Russia. These then were the circumstances under which Tyrell planned to see Yargo in 1914, the main source of Anglo-German tension, the naval arms race, at an end, the resurgence of Russian power frightening both, and increasing cooperation between the two in international affairs. A basis for further agreements was obviously there. Yargo himself openly talked about the improving relationship between the two countries. Tyrell had originally been a hardline Entente supporter, but his views by this point had changed. As Thomas Otti puts it, he began to see using Germany as a way of holding Russia's feet to the fire over the East and staying committed to the 1907 agreement. In reality, as Christopher Clarke argues, the agreement was likely to be discontinued when it came up for renewal in 1915. He arranged to see Yargo in 1914, but postponed until September for ill health. The meeting was to be of a clandestine nature and in an unofficial capacity, but Tyrell had his master, the Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Gray's full support. As he wrote just three days before the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, we are on good terms with Germany now, and we desire to avoid a revival of friction with her, and we wish to discourage the French from provoking Germany. We will never know what may have come from the meeting, for the July crisis and the guns of August intervened before it could be held. What seems almost certain is that closer cooperation between Germany and Britain was inevitable. Grey did not plan to end the Entente with France but an understanding with Germany would mean Britain no longer had to appease Russia over Central Asia, and could take a firmer stance with St. Petersburg. In time, as the Russian army completed its rearmament, Britain and Germany may have found themselves in complete alignment. This, of course, is speculation on my part, but these events do tell us some interesting things. Firstly, we must not see Anglo-German relations as a linear story of escalation, the period between 1912 and 1914 was one of rapid détente between the two countries that looked set to continue. Secondly, Edward Grey's diplomacy should be seen as more subtle and flexible than the caricature of a man rigidly tied to the Entente he is sometimes portrayed as. And finally, just what an immense folly Germany's decision to go to war and invade Belgium in the process was. Though she was undoubtedly going to be increasingly challenged by Russian power from 1917, the Entente's encirclement was well on its way to being broken by 1914. Had Germany maintained her course, her geopolitical position seemed likely to improve considerably. Instead, Berlin ended the détente with Britain prematurely, gambling that crushing the Russian army before it was ready was better than seeking a diplomatic solution to its geopolitical conundrum.